two, two main incentives for government to think about government 2.0. The first is um, what we call co-production. So this is the idea that um, uh, a lot of the things that government does to provide services um, it are in response to weaknesses in society or, or gaps or the need for government to prop certain categories of people up, provide them with services which they are unable to do for themselves. Um, so co-production is the idea that rather than just having this passive service provision relationship, government would rather work at the idea that um, citizens can be made more capable and more resilient and therefore less demanding of government services. And they can do that by co-producing government services. Now a good example is um, a hospital treats sick people. The logic of co-production is all about trying to keep people well so that they don't need to be consuming the government service of healthcare. So a government 2.0 initiative in healthcare, for example, would try and address a broad range of issues associated with encouraging citizens to think about their health, to take more exercise, to consume less alcohol, to have more healthy lifestyles. And that could be done not just by passively sending people information in the government 1.0 way, but trying to engage people in a series of activities or exercises or something which causes them to think about their health in a different way, to join a club or a society, to take up a sport, etc. So this is co-production, that's the first driver. Um, the second driver is the notion of participation as a way to um, to make government more relevant in people's lives and to help people trust and respect their government. Um, so enabling people, for example, to provide input and feedback to government, to participate in policy development um, in a real way rather than just sending letters to their member of, of parliament. So the use of forums, of blogs, of um, uh, consultative policy development processes to genuinely um, encourage people to participate in the development of government thinking is, a, is another core part of Government 2.0 and that's around building respect and trust and engagement with the community and the government. So there are those two drivers. One is co-production which is a kind of an efficiency driver. If government could do things smarter with this technology to engage people it would have to deliver less formal services. Um, and the second is this idea of participation, which is, which is often called e-democracy. Well, the, the core problem or challenge with Government 2.0 is the fact that it is inherently unpredictable. <coughs> um, governments uh, historically prefer to broadcast than to engage. So they would rather broadcast a message to the people and the people would just passively consume it and say, thank you very much. Um, that's easier for government. But the idea of having a genuine dialogue with people um, is problematic because um, what happens if they say things that you don't want to hear? And then how do you then manage the resulting conversation in a constructive manner? Um, there are a great many issues associated with the risks to government of this interactivity um, and it requires a whole lot of new skills to manage that interactivity in a constructive way. Um, we've all seen examples of um, on, on things like Facebook or, or um, Twitter, social media, where you often see things said that you don't particularly agree with or are offensive or whatever. Um, and once they're said, they're said, they're there for the record. Um, so it's a challenge to manufacture conversations in social media that, um, that achieve everyone's objectives. Governments have a very broad range of objectives to be achieved. Um, and it takes a new skill set to know how to manage this is the first challenge. Um, the second challenge is that um, a, a lot of one of the core parts of Government 2.0 that we haven't talked about is this idea of um, freeing government data. So making government data more available to the community 
so that people can use it to inform their own thinking, but also to cut and dice it and mash it up into different applications and solutions to also to co-produce government value. So a good example is um, governments releasing mapping information and statistics and travel information, uh, public transport route timetables, etc. And citizens mashing all this up to create new maps of the city to help you efficiently plan your use of public transport or to know the best way to bike to work or those things. And these are just applications which are created, co-produced based on data sets that are released from. Now some of those data sets are quite non-contentious but others are very contentious. Um, data sets around social disadvantage, uh, drugs, uh, crime, etc are able to be misinterpreted and used for purposes that government wasn't really intending. So once, it's again this problem of once it's interactive, it's less predictable and less controllable. And one of the core issues for governments is being confident that if they let this genie out of the bottle, that uh, it won't do destructive things or things that they can't control or didn't intend. Um, and again, it just requires a whole set of new skills and thinking about how to create this co-production and engagement in a way that is prudent and responsible and safe, given all of the requirements of government to look after many, many different interests. So, so Government 2.0 in that sense is easy to say as a concept, but actually quite hard and challenging to do um, in, in a predictable, somewhat controlled, somewhat responsible kind of way.